for tonight's topic, um, the focus, I think, begins with wanting to understand human biology. Um, human bodies, in fact, all biological organisms, are very complex, and to understand them often requires what we call models, and those models don't mean that you are exactly duplicating what that system is, but it's a way to try and understand some aspects of that system. One of the areas that would be most fascinating and most valuable to learn about is the human brain, both because we're interested in ourselves and how we operate, but also because of many diseases that affect the brain, whether it's autism or epilepsy and others. So if we could somehow isolate parts of the human brain and study it, that would be ideal. And tonight's speaker is one of the people working from a perspective of stem cell research that allows us to do some of that. Um, Alison Watry, who is our speaker, you can see in your programs a description of his many credentials and his excellent work in this area. But he is a really good example of what the Ethics Center is looking for. He knows that his, he knows from a scientific perspective and trying and seeing diseases, he believes that his work is very important. But he also knows that there are ethical questions that go with that work. And so he's been one of the leaders at UCSD now asking for ways to try and have conversations about those ethical challenges and figure out how best to meet them. Part of that willingness is his willingness to come here tonight and join us to talk about um, using a modeling system to look at the human brain. So uh, join me in welcoming Allison. Um, all right. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. I can't stress enough how important it is, this kind of conversation, especially when it's a cutting-edge technology uh, that not many of us have heard or are familiarized with that. And sometimes, uh, especially when stem cells are involved, uh, this might sound uh, futuristic, but it's actually happening right here, right there. And, um, and I think that, that's why uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to share uh, what's the work that's been cooking in my lab at UCSCD. So um, I am uh, a geneticist by formation, I got a PhD in genetics, and I am, I'm, I'm also um, uh, a neuroscientist, and I've been working on the pediatrics department at UCSCD. I'm also the director of the stem cell uh, program at UCSCD, and you, I hope you, I, you can appreciate how those two things will uh, intersect uh, during my talk. Uh, but before I start, I want to just uh, to point it out that uh, one of the main reasons I'm here is because of this guy, and he's my son, <laughs> and he's super cute. <laughs> he's 12 now; he's a little bit older, <clears throat> but uh, he has autism and epilepsy. And these are conditions that really affect his life. So it's really hard for him to go to school. Uh, he's nonverbal to communicate, adds lots of stress. There's lots of things that happens in his daily life that um, is really hard. And I, 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 I sympathize with that. And many of those disorders, they actually started very early during brain development. And that's one of the key things um, about what I do. It is the fact that. Uh, human brain while you're in uterus is inaccessible. So we cannot really uh, recruit a pregnant um, woman to come to my lab and, and, and offer the embryos so I can study their brains, uh, especially the ones um, that have high risk for autism. So that's, that's, that's not, not acceptable. So uh, we rely on um, non-invasive methodologies like the ultrasound, so you could visualize the embryo while you're in uterus. The problem with these methodologies is that they don't have the definition or, uh, or, or the resolution to go in deep and, and really probe what's going on uh, in a single cell at the level of the synapses. And more importantly, I cannot really experiment with them. I cannot test what's going wrong. So I can just observe. So it's a passive type of research. And I think um, uh, Mike pointed out that uh, we, as a scientist, we keep looking for models. I mean, and, and this is a key thing um, in this type of research. So in, in before I start, I want to stress um, what is a model. And all the time when I ask, ask my friends or the audience what is a model, I get a different perspective, different answers. Uh, I'm coming from Brazil. And when I ask my colleagues what is a model, they often relate it to this type of model, right? And, uh, and to be honest, they are not wrong. 
this is a model. Uh, the same way that this is a model of a train or this is a model of a flying machine. And the point is models are uh, non-perfect or, or simplify versions of the reality. And all of those are, in a way, uh, simplified versions of the reality. Not all women look like that, no, or all airplanes look like that, but we kind of experiment with models, trying to understand what's reality. And uh, the best models are the ones that you can improve in complexity to get closer and closer to the reality. So that's important in stem cell biology. So the models we have right now to study the brains are the following. We have postmortem tissues. I mean, these are people that uh, just die and they donate their brains to science. And I can take advantage of these postmortem tissues and, and kind of look what's the structure of the brain. But postmortem tissues are hard to get. Uh, they are uh, dead tissue. I cannot see live cells. I cannot uh, ask how the live cells are doing. And uh, most of the time, they come to me when uh, uh, the subject um, uh, has passed away in, uh, in different conditions, for example, a car accident, and that adds a different level of variables that I'm, I, I should consider. And most of the time, we don't have all these variables. We don't know if the individual has taken drugs, for example. All of those can affect my interpretation of uh, the tissue. So the other type of model is, is blood. And we take blood from lots of diseases and we study what's going on with their blood, cytokines, uh, Im immune responses. But the problem is blood are not brain cells and blood does not make or form synapses or connections between these brain cells. So it's a, there is a limited information I can take from blood cells. And finally, I think this has been like uh, the key model for biomedical sciences in the past years is animal models. Most of them are done uh, with mouse. These are like small rodents that you can keep them um, in the lab and, and do experiments with them. But mouse models, especially for complex disorders like autism, are not ideal. Uh, in autism, you have a lack of communication, eye contact, a verbal communication with each other. Do you know how mouse communicate to each other? They sniff each other's butt. <laughs> so how can we, I mean, compare that to, to the human uh, uh, behavior, right? I mean, we don't do that. Some of us don't do that. <laughs> well, but, uh, but, but, but this is the point. I mean, we are lacking a model of the human brain. And this has been like uh, the major reason why we don't have new drugs for neurological disorders. You can see that uh, cancer has um, developed many drugs, many therapies. Neurological disorders are falling behind. We have many drugs for heart, but not the brain. So the lack of a model, a good model. So I'll be talking today about uh, this idea of a mini brain in a dish. And I'll start right there uh, saying that this is the name that is catchy for the media. When you talk about a mini brain in a dish, that's immediately what you imagine. That, well, yeah, I mean, these guys can grow these brains uh, inside these Petri dishes. But that's a horrible name because that's not it, and I'll show you exactly what it is. But it's a catchy name, and people have been using it, and, and, and I mean, so far so good, as long as you understand that this is not the real representation. So, and even this model has limitations, and I'll, I'll start right there by pointing these limitations for you. So most of the time, these uh, mini brains or brain in a dish are immature. Uh, they are not fully vascularized. Not all cell types are represented. We don't even know how to grow them because the human brain grows in uterus and we don't have access to the uterus. And we don't know if we, what we learn from these mini brains in a dish can be translated to the brain of that person. So it's all unknowns. So we have asked ourselves if this technology can be really disrupted as a new model for neurological disorders, and, and, and we don't have that answer right now. So the way we generate these mini brains in the lab is by using cells that has been uh, reprogrammed from people. So these are skin cells or dental pulp cells that I can take from the subjects of my research. For example, my son, I got cells from his body, and I transformed these cells into pluripotent stem cells. And from these pluripotent stem cells, I can use a recipe with different factors and different uh, nutrients to guide them to become brain cells. And over the time, uh, they self-organize. That's the key thing. In the past, I thought that I will have to teach the cells how to do it, but they can self-organize. 
and, um, and it starts to mature and form different brain regions or different types of brain cells in there. So this is uh, Isabel. She's a postdoc in my lab. And um, what she's doing is uh, handling a, a, a dish. Uh, and in each well of those, there are these white dots. There's about hundreds of them in each well. So each one of these white dots is one of these brain organoids. So they can take up to half centimeter. Uh, that's as much as they will grow. Why they don't grow bigger? Because they're not vascularized. So nutrients cannot get inside to make them grow bigger. So they're limited growth. Uh, but the point is, all the time when we generate them, it's not a single one. We can generate hundreds, if not thousands of them at the same time. And the reason why they are uh, uh, is, uh, is small can be an advantage because we can use for drug testing, for example. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that uh, a little bit later. So when I mentioned that they can self-organize, um, they do because they have uh, the genetic programming uh, to do so. And this is uh, exactly how they do in, 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 in the real brain during development. Uh, on the top, you have uh, the progenitor cells. These are cells that are just being born and they will migrate out. You can see that there are some cables. There are cells that project cables outside of the center of the organoid right there. They will migrate out and start to specialize in the different cell types that form your cortex. We are focusing on the cortex because that's the brain region that is involved in, um, in high cognition, in memory, in learning. So this is your cortex. Diseases such as autism, epilepsy, it's all affecting your cortex. So we specialize in, into the cortex. There are other brain regions that we can develop recipes for these uh, cells to, to become as well. And um, so if you just slice one of these brains and, and check it out, I mean, how they look like, you're going to see something like that. There is a ventricular zone in there, uh, something that looks like an um, uh, 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 empty space but they are surrounded by these progenitor cells and they will migrate out, as I said, following those cables. These are specialized cells that help the migration of these neurons and they will form this cortical plate. So this is what happens at very early stages in uterus. So you're able to recapitulate that. So there are some, uh, there is some organization of uh, the tissue of the structure and that was something that we never had in the past. So by the way, these are advances that are happening in the past five years or so. So it's quite new that we can get to that level of uh, resolution and organization. So we also run experiments to determine what kind of cells we have in there. So this is a, a graphic where we have different dots. All, every single dot is a cell. And these cells were dissociated from one of these organoids and we spread it out and we ask what, what's the identity of those cells. So most of these cells are neurons that are excited. So these are the ones that pass the information. We do have some neurons that are inhibitory neurons. Uh, they uh, come into, um, in a lower percentage, but they grow over time. And then there are uh, also uh, glia cells or other cell types that help these neurons to mature and form all the proper connections. So we, we have a good representation of the cell types, but not all. It's just like the beginning of uh, uh, the human development. And we can compare that with uh, postmortem tissues. And we've done uh, some experiments in that sense. And what these graphics here are showing is that um, these are tissues from embryonic stages uh, to a 60-year-old six, uh, person. And uh, we have a global gene expression. These are genes that are being activated over time. And the red shows that as we age these organoids uh, by one month and three months, um, the number of genes that are activated matches at different developmental stages, suggesting that they are maturing in the dish. So they're not only growing, but the neurons are becoming more mature. And they follow exactly the human trajectory, which is an, uh, another thing that was a, a big surprise for us. So now I show you that at the molecular level, they resemble the human brain. And I show you that uh, there are structures that also resemble the human brain. So these are pretty good advancements uh, from the neuroscience perspective. So the question is, uh, can this technology be useful? 
And um, the first thing that um, came to my mind, I was just developing this technology. And I told you I'm from Brazil. And it was about uh, the time when the Zika virus was striking as an outbreak in the northeast of Brazil. So I contacted my friend. I said, can I get an helicopter of the Zika virus? Because if it's the Zika virus that's causing all the brain defects, I can test. Because I cannot use a, a, an animal, because the Zika virus does nothing to an animal. But it could do something to the human brain. So at that stage, uh, people were um, almost discarding that the Zika virus was the causation of these birth defects, because we have no proof. So here's my small contribution to uh, that um, uh, outbreak. We actually were able to expose uh, these brain organoids to the Zika virus, and we published um, uh, this work suggesting that there is a direct causation between the Zika virus and the microcephalic cases that was born in, 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 in the northeast of Brazil. What did we observe? As we expose the brain organoids to the Zika virus, the virus migrate inside the organoid, kills all the progenitor cells, and as a consequence, you have a reduced cortical layer. So that was uh, the mechanism that the virus was using to uh, cause microcephaly. Uh, good news. Since we know that the Zika virus can, can destroy, can kill these brain organoids, we could use that as a drug screening platform. So this is another work where, um, I don't know if you can see here, in the, the, the first image are some of the brain organoids. Here is when we expose the Zika virus. It kills all these brain organoids. But then we test some drugs. And this is a drug that protects the brain organoids from the viral replication. And it's a drug called sulfosbuvir that is already approved by the FDA to use in hepatitis, uh, uh, hepatitis virus, against the hepatitis virus. So we were, we were able to repurpose this drug in a record time. It would take years if we didn't have that technology to find a drug against the Zika virus. So now if there is a second outbreak anywhere in the world, we know which drug we could use to treat those um, uh, uh, pregnant women that are positive for the Zika. And hopefully the babies will not be born with uh, microcephaly or any birth defect. That's record time in, 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 in science history, be able to go from the cause to a drug in two years. We did it in two years. That's quite amazing. So, um, but, uh, but here is a, a, another topic, and perhaps we are entering a more controversial topic. Uh, one thing is to use these brain organoids to see uh, defects in, 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 in the structural um, regions of the brain, for example, in the cortex. The other thing is to ask, can these brain organoids think? And um, so we didn't know if this was a possibility. So nobody has ever tried. And it was um, um, uh, during one discussion in our lab meeting that we thought, well, I mean, maybe we should, we should, we should try. We should test. So we plate these brain organoids in, in plates that are um, similar to this one here on the left. And on the bottom of those dishes, you have electrodes. These are electrodes that capture the signal as the neurons fire. And you generate activity maps, such as that one in, uh, on, on the right. So show all the time when you see these lights blinking, it's because there are activity passing through, through these electrodes. And when we did that, we noticed that not only they were uh, active, but as we age them, they are becoming more and more active. So just to give you a perspective of um, what we did, um, if I just plot um, something like that, so these are uh, the amount of brain activity in those uh, red dots are just some of the work that was doing previously uh, using other technology. Um, and you see that everything is kind of below 5 hertz or around 5 hertz. And what we want to have as a brain activity is something similar to a primate brain, like 20 hertz. The human brain is about 22 hertz. So none of the technology we had before could pass this 5 hertz. But with the brain organoids, we can keep them alive for longer periods of time. And the original protocol to generate these brain organoids was uh, 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 also not very active. So that's why nobody was expecting to see any activity on these organoids. And um, you can, if you see the date, this is 2017. 
So I'll tell you now the version 2.0 of this protocol. And uh, in this uh, curve, you can see um, the weekly measurement of this activity over time. And by 40 weeks or nine months, what we get is something similar to a primate brain in terms of activity. This is unprecedented in tissue culture, in vitro. Nobody could ever reproduce uh, a brain activity that's similar to um, uh, the human brain. And if we have that much activity, you can measure something like brain waves. Uh, some people might recognize an EEG. You can see all these waves doing EEG. And uh, turn out that we can see those waves from these mini brains as well. These we reported uh, uh, in December last year during the neuroscience meeting here in San Diego. And uh, we measure or we compare that with fetal uh, uh, brain and we use preterm EEG brains uh, to do this comparison. So here is how it works. Uh, we generate a machine learning algorithm where we predicted what's the age of the brain based on the EEG parameters uh, coming from postnatal uh, preterm babies uh, born between 25 and 38 weeks. And after we train the machine, we ask, uh, to, uh, we ask the machine to determine the age of our brain organoids. And the result, it's quite striking. So the red bar is the perfect prediction by the machine. And what we see is that after 25 weeks, the prediction is really good. Before 25 weeks, the prediction is really bad. And the reason why the prediction is bad is because we could never train the machine with a brain that is before 25 weeks, because the human brain does not survive. We could never get an EEG before 25 weeks. So if a baby is born uh, with 25, 24 weeks, will likely die. So medical doctors are pushing the boundaries. Now there are even some centers around the US that can keep the baby alive uh, for that, uh, in that early stages, but we don't know the consequences of doing that. So we, but anyways, I mean, we couldn't train the machine. And uh, this is just one example. When we train the machine, we can see that um, by 40 weeks, it matches something that's similar to uh, a nine month um, healthy postnatal uh, newborn uh, human brain. So quite impressive that the technology is matching exactly how human development is doing. So what are the other applications for that? Uh, one thing is uh, we could use these brain organoids to study human brain evolution, for example. And um, this is one of the projects in the lab. Sometimes people get confused why he's doing that. And I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can convince you. So in the past, we were not the only humans that were alive, but there are many humans alive, and these are some of the fossil records that we have. The ones that we have the most information are the Neanderthals. They have overlap with us. We, can even, uh, we even have evidence that they breed with us, and we all have pieces of Neanderthal genomes in our cells. So why the Neanderthals are interesting? Because they have been living on Earth for longer periods than us, uh, and their technology has not evolved um, uh, as much. So fossil records at early stages and fossil records at late stages are quite similar. Someone, someone might argue that, well, I mean, they improved the technology, but that's it. That's still a stone tool. We humans, I don't think I need to remember you, but, but, but we start with stone tools, and now we put the man on the moon. We have Facebook, we communicate, we are talking in this room. So these are all um, consequences of uh, the brain evolution. How come our brain is so much sophisticated compared to, um, to other of those, um, uh, our ancestors? So this is one of the things that we are doing. Uh, we can genetically manipulate these cells to carry Neanderthal uh, genetic variants and produce organoids from these um, uh, uh, cell lines. Um, just to give you an example, some of the experiments we did, actually we can see differences between them. And even at the functional level, if we measure them using that technology that I told you on the multi-electrode arrays, we can see that uh, the cells that has or that carry the ancestral genes, uh, they behave um, in, a very, uh, in a very similar way as they do with autism, for example. So finally, um, 
we have been uh, looking ways to mature these organoids. The truth is, on that curve that I show you, after nine months, we see a plateau. And uh, when they reach that plateau, we don't see any more uh, maturation of these organoids. So we ask, can we actually uh, mature even further these organoids, even though they are not vascularized, for example? So that uh, is uh, the concept of a brain, a vat, a uh, brain that's just floating around. Can we stimulate with experience? And perhaps this brain will, will think that has a body and, and actually behave as a, a, as a normal brain. So there are several ways of doing that. I'll, I'll, I'll give you like uh, two flavors. One is uh, to stimulate this brain using a mini retina. The stem cells can also be used to create a mini eye. And what you have here is the green, is the mini retina that was plugged into the human cortex. So now we can stimulate the retina and see how the cortex responds. So we are creating a visual cortex. So that's one way to stimulate. The other way is to give a body to these uh, brain organoids. And I've uh, been discussing about a robotic body. And uh, this is one of uh, 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 the projects in the lab that has help from a high school student here in La Jolla. So he was the one who actually built that robot. And what you're going to see here, um, it is uh, the robot that is uh, walking uh, and is moving their legs based on uh, the brain activity that's coming from these organoids on the top left. And, and below here is the computer telling the robot what to do. And you see as the organoid peak on activity, uh, it accelerate or speed up uh, uh, its leg. I'm not sure if you can see from here, but there are actually two eyes on the organoids. These are sensors. They are sensing uh, if there is an obstacle come close to you. And uh, as they get close to a wall or, or, or something, uh, these eyes are telling the robot um, that uh, I'm getting close to something. And the idea now is to use as a learning mechanism where we're going to stimulate these organoids uh, using different neurotransmitters, for example, dopamine, to give them some kind of reward so they can stop and walk back. So in the future, we hope to remove the computer from the equation and make the organoid learn by itself how to explore the environment. So this is uh, one way of doing. And I'll just um, finish here with one last thing. It is um, this technology. Uh, we are not fully aware of the potential and where this goes. Uh, we keep looking of uh, potential applications for that. Uh, but one thing that I would like to finish is that we, different from uh, the body, we are not uh, restricted by a skull. We are not restricted by other tissues. We can create brains that never exist. And we could even speed up human evolution. We could manipulate genes to create a brain that it is more intelligent, that is more resistant to Alzheimer's, that is more empathic or has a different shape, or we could connect different brains from different people and create a network. So these are all the possibilities that I uh, would be exploring in the future. And, um, and I'll stop here um, so we can open for discussion. But first, I'll thank uh, uh, my lab, my collaborators, all the families and subjects that participate on this research. And just full disclosure, I'm a co-founder of Tismo. It's a biotech, a startup company uh, that uses these brain organoids to screen drugs for autism. Thank you very much. So while we're collecting some of your, your thoughts, which we will get back to in a, in a moment, um, I have a few questions for Allison. Um, one of the things I often ask our speakers at the beginning is something about how they got started. And you already told us a bit about that. Part of your interest acutely is in your, your own son. Um, and as I just told Allison before hit the presentation, when I was planning my remarks, I knew that he worked on autism. And I knew I used to work on epilepsy. So I mentioned autism and epilepsy as the two examples, not knowing anything about his son. So we had a little bit of a, an overlap there. But it does raise an ethical question. So there are lots of questions about what it means when a scientist does research on himself or herself mm -hmm. um, and raises still more difficult questions when they choose to do that with their children. 
Now, recognizing that this will be videotaped and recorded and left on the web forever, so your son <laughs> will someday see this. Um, can you talk to us about what you had to do to consider having your son in the studies, your personal reflections, what an IRB expected of you? How did you deal with that? Yeah. So, um, well, I, um, I think I placed my son as a, a, a representative of a group, right? I mean, he has a specific genetic defect, a mutation in a gene, and there are other kids with uh, that mutation and that gene. And we were studying that, hoping to um, bring better treatments and, um, and, and potential cure uh, for, for those who are affected with that uh, genetic alteration. So um, in the lab, obviously, I have a dual role. I mean, I'm a father excited about this technology. I'm also a scientist. And uh, I often get this question from the uh, parents from the other children. I said, well, how do you do it? I said, well, I mean, let's put it this way. I wouldn't test uh, my son uh, if I didn't know that if something is really helpful. So I'll be extra critical on, on the experiments. And I'll not cut corners. And uh, if I can't do it with my son, I would not ask your son to do it. And uh, most of the time, they're comfortable with that. They feel even better because they said, well, this guy's being like putting the threshold really high. And, um, and I, I, that, that's how I feel it. So uh, there is a couple of people working in my lab with uh, cells from my son. Uh, he was recruited like any other family. And, um, and it's interesting. Uh, I think the most rewarding aspect it is uh, to have the subject right there. So when I go home, I see the subject, and, and, and I try to make uh, correlations with what I see it and, 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 and how this would affect the research. And it has an impact on research, because in the beginning, when we started, he didn't have seizures. He had autism, but the seizures appears later. So now we are looking into these brain organoids. Do we see a seizure response from these brain organoids? Can we? Can you use these brain organoids to create a platform to test seizure medications? So it, it's evolving together. Um, I know a couple of scientists uh, who are in the same position as, as I am, and, um, and, and, and I think, I mean, we are all comfortable in doing that because we know that it's not only for one kid, it is for a group of them. And if we help one, we're going to help many. Okay, so um, we may later have some questions from the audience about that further. So, um, so there is a, a general question that um, is important here because you talked about some very controversial things one might do with um, these neural networks in, in, a, in, in the laboratory. Um, and what I'm thinking of is there's the recent reports of a scientist in China who decided to genetically modify, um, or at least reportedly genetically modified embryos for children and planted them in a mother's womb, and they were born subsequently. And most of the scientific community is very opposed to doing that. But it does raise a question of who is responsible when science is misused? I mean, some people in this room may think there's some things that you talked about today that they certainly don't want to see done now, and they might never want to see done. So who's responsible? Who sets the boundaries? Is it just you? Mm -hmm. um, um, how can those boundaries properly be set? Yeah. So, um, in, in, in I recently have this discussion uh, with my team and, and others at UCSD. So what if someone uh, teaches one of these brain organoids to drive a drone and bomb uh, another place? What, what is the misuse of this technology? And there's plenty of examples of misuse of this technology. So what we do, and this is our responsibility as a, as a scientist, we disclosure to the university um, that we have a new invention. So now I disclose that I have a brain organoid able to create these oscillation waves. And this was never done before. And there are consequences. So the university tried to protect that right by patenting it. Or, 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 or having the rights to negotiate the use of technology wherever the university thinks is appropriated. So it, it, it's not on my hands, but it kind of goes to the university. And, and, and being UCSD in, in a public university with lots of people that um, I trust, I think it's in good hands. But what, what if someone in China or whatever other place uh, that uh, may not follow the same rules uh, that we have decided to do it anyways? And that's what happens with the CRISPR baby. 
So that we can control. The only way to control that is uh, by evolving as a society and as a, a glo global society by discussing that among different nations and, and, and putting a limit on, on uh, what's the use of this technology. I think the same thing happens with uh, chemical um, attacks, right? I mean, uh, the humanity decided that we shouldn't use this kind of um, chemical weapons. And um, so does it inhibit someone of using? Yeah. It might, right? But someone may still use it. So, yeah. I'm, I'm sure if I was clear, but. <laughs> no, you were, and, and, and that is one of the problems that people could, scientists could still do this in various places. But I guess um, there's not just the question of what happens when um, somebody wants to patent something, but if, let's say tomorrow, you felt you had the means technologically to produce a brain in the lab that was thinking and self-aware and you have it confined in a dish and you're going to study it and stimulate it in various ways and leave it in the dark for, for weeks while you do something else. What's to stop you from doing that? Yeah, so there's nothing to, that stops me from doing that. And uh, uh, it, it might be that the technology will grow to that stage where we have like a fully self-aware, conscious brain uh, inside the lab. And, um, and then we'll have uh, to set up a, a, a a bar, I mean, where, how far can I go? Can I keep those things alive? Um, or, or maybe I should not even get there, should not even go there, and not grow them to that stage, and, but uh, eliminating the possibility of uh, them of becoming conscious or self-aware. Right now we have no indication that they are conscious or self-aware. Tomorrow we might have some evidence that they might be conscious or self-aware. Or when we start plugging different pieces, uh, I show you that we can embody them by making them control a robot or having uh, a retina plugged into the cortex. So maybe they will store a memory inside. And if that stores a memory, it becomes a person or becomes an individual. So these are questions that I don't know the answer yet. Yeah, well, it's gonna take a lot of work. I mean, right now I'm thinking about the fact that we are very far from what I just described as a scenario. I mean, just to be clear, if anybody's worrying that you could do that, um, and you just said you would be able to do that on your own, I think actually the answer to that is it's not quite so simple because you're basing this work on the use of pluripotent stem cells. UC San Diego, at least, requires you to have that reviewed by a stem cell committee and an institutional review board, and they would ask questions about what are you going to do with this. And at that point, somebody could say, you're going to do what? <laughs> and, and might ask you to stop. Um, the first question on the pile was actually pretty much what we just described, but um, who will decide what characteristics can be manipulated in a living human brain? And I think your answer was, right now, it's largely you, but with the re review by committees at the university. Yeah, there is always like a, a, a committee that reviews the proposed experiments and if there is anything that they, they feel that's uncomfortable. By the way, this committee is not only uh, made by scientists, but uh, other people as well. So they have different perspectives on, on a specific experiment. And um, at the end of the day, they will judge um, how the science should progress. So um, next question is, will we create, or I think there's, they're saying, would we be able to create people with deficits in intelligence and with disease? At this point, it's actually occurs to me we should also qualify the term people. So if you're doing something in the laboratory in a dish, it really it's a philosophical question. What point is that a person? Um, but right now, let's talk about that brain organoid tissue that you have in a dish. Right. Um, so. Uh, remember when I show you the brain activity that mimics the human development up to nine months or, 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 or a postnatal or newborn um, baby? So the question is, is a newborn baby self-aware and conscious? And um, sometimes when I ask people, I get different uh, answers. Some people think, no, they are not self-aware, they're not conscious. But still, we treat them as a person. So is the, the brain organoid that we just create self-aware and conscious? We have no idea if they are or not. Um, but anyways, there is many things that are missing for them to call them a person. And I think, uh, uh, and, and, and plus, I mean, these are all artificially created. So we kind of design how we want them to behave or, or what parts we should have. 
So these are all um, uh, things that um, it could evolve to something that would, would become a little bit more mature. Um, but as you pointed out, right, right now, I mean, I think we are quite far from that because uh, science is, is making like small progress at the time and um, there is no way that we, we're gonna have the technology to recreate the entire brain a dish like the picture I show you. It would be impossible to do it right now with the technology that we have. So the question, the hypothetic question is, what about in the future? If we can do that? So I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a very good technical question here. How long can you keep these cells alive in a dish? I mean, obviously, you know. But yeah, so we've been trying to push them as much as uh, we can, and they uh, so far has been um, uh, living inside the, the incubators of the lab for a little bit more than two years. Uh, but what we see is that after nine months, the activity doesn't uh, change. So it's not that they are maturing, it's not that we are gaining anything by keeping them alive. Uh, inside the organoid, we start to see necrosis, because as I pointed out, um, the factors are not getting inside uh, these organoids, so we're not, uh, they're not growing more, so they're just stuck. Um, we have the technology to feed the cells inside. I mean, one can imagine like a small tube or, or a, a vascular system that goes there and keep them alive a little bit longer. Maybe we can grow them a little bit bigger, uh, but that's it. So, um, yeah, a couple of months, uh, years. Uh, but right now we don't see advantage of keeping them more than nine months. Yeah, so there's a, a geometry question or a topology question, which is, I mean, clearly you can't make a large mass because of the vascularization type of an issue, but you could, in theory, have a long, thin um, strand of cells. So have you tried to see how long you can stretch this out, or is that? Yeah, no, that's a fascinating question, and we always um, uh, think about that. We haven't done those experiments. These are totally possible to do it, uh, to create different shapes of, of, of these brains. And maybe there is one shape that would be uh, better, more efficient on, on capturing the nutrients or the energy that we have uh, in there. So we haven't tried, but it's totally possible. We could uh, fold um, uh, uh, matrices for these cells to aggregate in the way we want. We can even bioprint them in the shape and form that we want and see how they evolved. Um, these are all possibilities that we we, we hope to explore in the future. Yeah, I, it just occurred to me that you could, in theory, have such a shape that, like DNA folds on itself, could be entirely bathed in your medium with lots of gaps in between, but lots of also points of connection between the points as it wraps around. So <laughs> you, you, there's, it's amazing the things you could do with this. So um, I'm not sure I entirely understand this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway just to see what you have to say. So it says, what if you were mistaken about the cure for Zika virus? What then? And I don't know whether this is a before, in other words, you tried it and it didn't work in the laboratory, or after, you know, you thought it works you, based on laboratory experiments, then people started using it mm -hmm. and it didn't work, so. Yeah, well, um, yeah, so we haven't done uh, uh, the, the test itself. We haven't tried in people because there was no uh, further outbreak of, of, of the Zika virus. So uh, we have to wait for this to happen. Hopefully it will not happen. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, the organoids are a model. They're missing lots of components. So the drug might work really well in the lab. And once you move to a clinical trial or in people, it might not work because the body might metabolize that drug in a different way. So we see that happening all the time. So when that happens, you go back to uh, the board and, and design a drug that can be metabolized in the right way or test a new drug. Uh, that was one of the, uh, the candidate drugs. So we have others that seems to work as well. So that's how science evolved. You have to try and most of the time you don't even know, you don't know if it's gonna work unless you do the clinical trial. Yeah. Great, thanks. So the next question I, I think can actually be turned around two ways. The question is what happens if robots can think like humans? But I would almost turn it around to say that what you're talking about doing, in the example you described here where you had your brain cells controlling a mechanical, mechanical movement of, a, of, a, of essentially a, a robot or a machine, um, 
in some senses, what you are doing is you are getting human cells to act like a computer, like a robot. So it's the other way around. But um, do you have any want to want to reflect on that a bit? The difference between cells in a dish and um, transistors and diodes and yeah. So this is a, another question that I get um, all the time. Um, is this organic intelligence any better than artificial intelligence? And um, we know that uh, a five-year-old brain, uh, someone with a five-year-old brain, could beat any artificial intelligence. So in theory, if we can grow these networks to the level of a five-year-old brain, um, human brain, we could beat any artificial intelligence. So I think it's more powerful. Uh, this is because evolution has been shaping the networks and optimizing the networks for millions and millions of years. And we are just playing with uh, neural networks using the same algorithms that we think it works. So it, it's good for driving a car, but if you want something more complex, I don't think you can achieve. So that's another possibility. Can we use these brain organoids as a computational power to solve uh, more complex uh, uh, questions? And I think we could. Yeah, so at this point, um, I, I did notice that in terms of the questions and, and on your cards, I didn't really see anything, and it may be that I just didn't get it, of anybody expressing any fears about the technology per se. Um, would anybody like to come to the microphone and tell us what, what worries you at, at this point? Anybody have any? So if you could come to the mic. Hi. Um, so one of my fears is how do you... Uh, the brain, as you just uh, mentioned, it can far outstrip any artificial intelligence that we have, and there's already many, many fears about what artificial intelligence could do. How do you protect against the abuse of this incredible system of neural cells uh, that we have and keep that system from being abused? You know, because it, if it's that powerful, it can it's that much more prone to abuse and create something that our regular brains will not be able to control. Yeah, I know that, that, that's what I fear as well, which is the misuse of the technology. But uh, this is true for any technology, right? I mean, how do you control? How do you make sure that it's using for good and not bad? And who defines what's good and what's bad? So I think um, I don't have all these answers. Just to elaborate on that a little bit more, I mean, you said you're somewhat confined now because you're associated with a public university and you have ethics committees, et cetera. But if your um, business becomes a boom, you may not find the necessity to get the ethics. And one of the things that Michael mentioned about um, these organo organoids, you know, if they became self-aware, you know, would we have a different criteria for the ethical considerations? And we forget, perhaps, that we do laboratory, at least on a global scale, we do laboratory, what I call cruel experiments on animals that are undeniably self-aware right now. So uh, it's scary that when we talk about Neanderthals and, and human evolution, that we are advancing at a more rapid state with the technology than we are advancing in the ethical considerations. Would you comment on that? Absolutely, and I, I think you are right on the point. And one of my hopes is that this kind of technology will eventually replace um, the use of animals for science. I mean, it's, 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 it's a new model. Right now, we can't do that. There's still like to toxicology experiments that needs to run into animals. But hopefully, this will go away, and, and we can use this kind of artificial models. Um, but you are absolutely right. Uh, there are um, evidence that um, even like small rodents like mice are self-aware and have some level of consciousness. What I think it bothers people is that when you talk about consciousness, it's not yes or no, but it's a, um, it is a spectrum. And human consciousness is what bothers people. So, um, and I don't know why, because I, I agree with you, I love animals, and I think um, they do have the same kind of consciousness, if not, if not even better than us. Um, but um, yeah, I don't think it's the majority of uh, the population that thinks that way. I might be wrong. 
Yes, but we, we can't forget that if that is a worry, then for some of the things one might want to study in, in a dish, um, as the technology develops, you would be producing an entity in that dish created by yourself, um, something that would be as self-aware as a mouse or a rat might be. So at this point, I'm guessing you have no means to test whether you've crossed a line to be able to decide that. Yeah, so um, this is one of um, uh, the experiments that we keep thinking about. How would you prove that a brain organoid is conscious or self-aware? How would you show that? We cannot even define that, but, but is there any indication that you could do it? There are some experiments that might point to a specific evidence. Uh, for example, when people go under anesthesia, uh, they uh, change their brain waves and they seem that they are not uh, uh, conscious of what's going on. At least most people f seems like they don't remember what happens. So what if we treat these organoids with anesthetics and they change their brain waves in the same way that humans do? Does it mean that they had conscious and now they don't have it? Um, so these are the evidence that we can build it up and um, to answer those questions. But right now, I mean, again, it's just very speculative. Um, these are cells in a dish. Yeah, so um, one challenge to that is a kind of question I used to ask of students in a physiology course years ago, and that is, how would you know whether somebody's brain was functioning and conscious if either A, they had no means to have an impact on the world, or B, they had no means to take in information about the world? In order to answer that question, it seems to me ultimately you have to have input and output. And if you're doing that, by the time you get to that point, it seems like it's too late to be asking that question. So anyway, um, another question, yeah. Um, I have, I actually have a more science-based question and then a more ethical question. Um, so the first was, uh, just curious if you've considered anything as far as putting the organoids like in vivo and mice and things like that and kind of seeing, you know, talking about the vascularization and stuff like that, because you can have the humanized mice and stuff to avoid some of the issues you would have. Uh, with their immune system, have you done anything with that or thought about that? Uh, there are uh, people who have done that, and uh, they see that sometimes the vascularization system of the animal can uh, help to vascularize the brain organoids. The problem is that they are inside an animal, and uh, uh, because now they have vascularization, they will grow bigger, and there's so much that the animal can support, so most of the time they have to stop the experiments, otherwise they'll kill the animal. So um, this is what we call a chimera when we are mixing cells from two species. Most of the time, uh, we, we try to get away from the animal model. We wanna do everything in vitro. Again, because we don't want the confounding factors of uh, blood from a mouse to get inside the human brain. I mean, I, I, some experiments are done as a proof of principle that uh, you can vascularize, you can innervate, but at the end of the day, they're not practical. You cannot do hundreds and thousands of those to test drugs. So we, 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 we favor most of the time the in vitro system. I just didn't know from discovery standpoint what you might be able to learn from that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the more ethical, uh, it's actually less about how the science affects the ethics and more about how, I guess, society could affect the science. Um, you, I guess maybe by being here, this is part of your way to try and handle, you know, the, um, the like the sensationalized media. Uh, so some of the stuff you're saying up there could be really scary to people if they don't know very much about it. And so what are the ways that you kind of, or what, what can we do to make sure, you know, concerns are handled, but at the same time don't limit our, the ability to continue on with the science? Yeah, I know that's a great question. It's all about education, and education not only for the lay public, but also for the scientists, because most scientists are even afraid of, about this conversation, right? I mean, they don't want to show up. They, they want to expose themselves. So um, the scientist has to change the way to, to interact with society. As we, we grow in, in more sophisticated experiments, it's, it's, it, it gets harder to explain, uh, and it gets harder for people to understand. I mean, we've seen that with, um, for example, um, the dolly, uh, the clone, right? 
I think it got people by surprise. Oh, <laughs> they clone an animal. What about if they clone a human? Uh, how, how this was done? I mean, people had no idea. And, um, and so w the society was not prepared. So I think what Mike and I and others, we are aware that uh, there are new technologies coming. And uh, the more we can share with society, the more we can discuss. Personally, what happens in my field is that uh, as we start publishing on that and the media was picking up, the reporters were calling me and say, um, oh, those, those uh, organoids, are they thinking? And I would immediately say, no. Uh, now I'm being more cautious because I don't know. That's the truth. <laughs> And, um, and, and until we, we have like good experimental design to prove either yes or no, the answer is I don't know. Um, but I think that's, um, that's been honest from, from, from my end, more honest than in the past. So I mean, one of the things that I think we should leave you with tonight, at least I would want to leave you with, and I don't know about Alison, is that much of what he talked about as things that might be interesting, that might be possible, are not already happening. It, much, much of this, most of it, is hypothesis-driven about what, where we might go and what we might do. And I think part of the reason that he's here tonight is to have people start to think about this so as a society we can figure out ahead of time what worries us and how we might best deal with it. So you should not just go home and close off the conversation. Talk to your friends, talk to family, um, talk to your legislators if needed, talk to scientists asking them to have meetings to talk about how they should do this. So I want to thank um, the audience and Allison for an, an interesting program. Thank you.